Hello guys and welcome to Trinity. It's great to have you with us wherever you, you may be watching from. Um, we are looking at Mark chapter 10. So I'm going to read the passage and then I'll pray and then we'll, we'll have a look at it together. This is Mark chapter 10 from verse 13. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at these words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, we have left everything to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you're a God who speaks to us, and I pray that you would do that now as we look at these verses. Um, we pray that you would challenge our innermost beings as we look at these words. For the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. What kind of world do you want to live in? What kind of a world do you want to live in? Uh, it's a big question, but I, a, a question I guess we all have uh, an answer for. I wonder what your answer is for that. What kind of world do you want to live in? A world with natural beauty, but without crime, right? No electric fences, no gates, no locks. Leave your doors open. Uh, a world that, that we can enjoy food and sport and music in, but where life is not spoilt by illness or disease or pandemics. A world where the leaders, the government, are not out for themselves, but, that, but that serve their people with genuine love for them. A world where everyone's kind to each other and everyone has enough. And of course, most importantly, a world that is not interrupted by death, that does not have that shadow hanging over it. In other words, life in a perfect world that goes on forever. I, I think that's what most of us want. You may be able to get some of these things in this world, um, but wherever you live, there'll always be selfishness and illness and death. You won't get it all. And we know that. And yet we still want it. There's a desire in each of us, I think, for a better world. C.S. Lewis famously said, there's a reason for that. He said, if, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world. He's saying we have desires for fulfillment and love and longevity, eternity and perfection, but they're not satisfied in this world. And that must mean, he says, that we were made for another world. Jesus calls that world the kingdom of God, a world that he came, in, came to bring in partially in his first coming, fully in his second coming. Now, if, if that kingdom is a real world, if that's legit, right, the next question, of course, is given that in small, some small way we all want to be a part of that, how do I inherit eternal life? How do I become part of the kingdom of God, book my place, so to speak? 
It's a hugely important question, isn't it? And it's the question Jesus gets asked in our passage today. Um, I don't know if you noticed as we read it in, in verse 17, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to enter the kingdom of God? And you may have various sort of assumed answers in the back of your head um, to this question, something about being a decent person, generally doing good and being in church or religion and so on. But what we're going to see is it's not so much um, what you do to enter the kingdom of God, uh, but what you must be to enter the kingdom of God. Um, there, There are two bits to our passage. In the first, Jesus gives the general principle of what we must be to enter the kingdom of God. And then in the second, there's like a case study of that principle. Uh, What's the general principle? What must I be to enter the kingdom of God? I must be like a child. Verse 13, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. So so people are bringing their children to Jesus, the rabbi, for for a blessing. That's not an uncommon uh, practice in Jewish culture. And we've seen Jesus with uh, children in his arms recently, haven't we? Remember in chapter 9 where he says to his disciples, he, he has a child in his hand, and he says to them, if you welcome this little insignificant child and serve him you are welcoming and serving me and welcoming and serving the one who sent me that was the lesson from the last chapter so when people bring their children to jesus today what happens the disciples rebuke the children and shoo them away i haven't quite learned the lesson jesus is not happy about this he's indignant and says no let them come in fact these children are your model for how to enter the kingdom of god Um, Last time his point was, be like me and welcome these children. Now his point is, be like these children if you want to enter the kingdom of God. Now what does he mean? In what way, how should we be like children? Well, think about this. When a baby or a child um, gets abandoned in the street or in the doorway, which very sadly happens still today, um, it's not long before that child gets to the end of their resources. Um, they can't protect themselves right, against the cold or against other people. They can't provide for themselves what they need, right? food, clothing or shelter. Very quickly they come to the end of their resources. They are completely helpless on their own and therefore dependent on an adult to help them. Children are dependent. They're called dependents on my medical aid tax form, on yours, dependents. And Jesus is saying, if you want to enter the kingdom of God, you have to be a dependent. You have to be the spiritual version of a child who realizes that actually they're at the end of themselves. You can't live the kind of life that God requires of you to enter his kingdom. You can't provide the righteousness you need to be accepted into heaven. You can try. You can live the best life you can. You can throw in some uh, religion. You can put on a good show for others. But deep down, you don't have it. You can't provide what you need. You can't protect yourself against sin, God's judgment at sin, against death. You're at the end of your spiritual selves. You're helpless on your own. You're dependent on someone bigger and stronger to help you, a a spiritual adult. Jesus says, unless you see yourself as a dependent, someone in need of forgiveness and grace, someone in need of God's help, someone in need of spiritual life, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Now, if you're not a Christian listening to this, I would suggest reflecting on what Jesus is saying here. How childlike are you? Perhaps that's the reason you haven't entered the kingdom of God. Often our natural instinct, right, is to present ourselves to God as a, as a kind of a strong, independent, got it all together, good religious person. But Jesus says, no, you, you won't enter the kingdom of God like that. Be a dependent. And in this sense, actually, we never really grow up as Christians. We grow in lots of other senses, but we're always spiritual children, aren't we, in need of God's help. Do you still see yourself as a child? Now, you might say, well, 
is, you know, is this all there is to it, right? It sounds pretty easy just to be childlike and then to enter the world that we're all after, the kingdom of God. Uh, it's easy. Well, you would think so, wouldn't you? Um, but our case study, as we'll see now, shows uh, there's a lot more to it than we think. Um, so the general principle, be like a child. And the first thing our case study shows us is it's necessary to give up everything to enter the kingdom of God. It's necessary to give Ooh, that's a bit extreme, you might say. That's not, that's not a great sales pitch for Christianity, is it? Well, if you've been with us the last few weeks in Mark's Gospel, you won't be too surprised by this extreme requirement from Jesus because Jesus has been setting the bar extremely highly um, when it comes to being his disciples, hasn't he? Uh, in terms of discipleship, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. In terms of serving, whoever wants to be first must be the very last, must uh, be the servant of all. In terms of sin, if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom, kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. And in terms of marriage and divorce, so they are no longer two but one, one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Je- Jesus has been set in the bar very high when it comes to being his disciples. Perhaps you felt that over the last few weeks. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? If the bar is that high, who is going to clear it? Who can be his disciples perhaps something his disciples are wondering in this passage but along comes an ideal candidate right a wealthy man other gospels describe him as a young man a man of influence um, you know the kind educated at hilton top lawyer in the city all the wealth and influence that goes with that and verse 17 tells us he runs up to jesus showing urgency falls on his knees before jesus showing humility And asks him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Showing understanding of what's important. So the disciples are probably thinking, this is is very promising. He, He should clear the bar pretty easily, right? But by the end of the paragraph, he chooses to walk away sad. What happens? What what went wrong? Well, the conversation takes a different turn. Um, Jesus, as he almost always does, answers his question, the guy's question, with another question. so he says, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 18, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Um, that was a fairly common deflection that rabbis would make in those days. Only God is good. Let's agree that we are not and God, only God is good. Verse 19, you know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. So so where does he go wrong? See, you might think the problem's with the original question, right? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And you think, well, that's that's where he's going wrong. He's trying to climb the ladder himself to the kingdom of God by doing things. And you expect Jesus, Jesus to say, no, 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 stop, stop trying to keep the law to enter the kingdom of God. But instead, he, he says almost the opposite, doesn't he? He says, you know the commands. Do not murder, adultery, steal. He lists all the commands. The man says, I've kept these since I was a boy. And again, you expect Jesus to say, well, look, that's quite enough of, of keeping laws and doing things. It's time for you to receive grace. But instead of that, he's, he says, well, here's something else for you to do. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And we've heard this before, haven't we? Sell everything you have and give to the poor and follow me is the money version of deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me, isn't it? You will have treasure in heaven is the money version of whoever loses their life for me will save it. See, he's just, he's just applying to money what he's already said in chapter 8. But of course, the man, the man just can't do it, can he? And he walks away sad. And I don't know if you noticed, Jesus only lists six of those commandments, doesn't he? And most, child will be able to, most children will be able to tell you, actually, it's ten. Um, he appeared to score really highly, this guy, didn't he? But he's actually only completed half the exam paper. I don't know if you've had that experience. Um, you think, oh, this, 
this exam's going really well, I've got plenty of time, only to realize at the end you didn't turn over the page and do the other questions, maybe it's just me. Um, but this guy hasn't turned over the page. What, what's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. Uh, second commandment, do not make for yourself an idol. A actually, when you turn over the page, this guy fails miserably, doesn't he? This is exactly what he's done, isn't it? Money has become his God, his idol, and he puts it before Jesus. And that's, that's why he walks away. When he came to a choice between uh, following Jesus and his money, he chose his money. He put his false God before the true God that was standing right in front of him. So his problem is not that he tries to be good, but that he fails to be good. It's not that he you know, loves God's law too much, it's that he doesn't love it enough. Actually, he just proves Jesus' original statement, doesn't he, that no one is good except God alone. But, but what I want us to notice that is that in the face of this, how Jesus reacts to him in verse 21, I don't know if you spotted that, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Almost as if Jesus looked into him and saw his heart um, enslaved to the God of money and just loved him, uh, pitied him perhaps. And so what he says to him about selling everything he has and giving it to the poor and storing up treasure in him and come follow me, what he says that's very challenging is said, it's said out of a heart of love. Remember that when you hear Jesus say stuff you don't like you don't like hearing when he says stuff you disagree with or it's too extreme it comes from a heart of love towards you so in his one ear he has Jesus saying get rid of the idol come follow me I will give you eternal life a quality and quantity of life your money cannot ever buy life in a perfect world forever and in his other ear money is saying no 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 follow me I'll give you pleasure, I'll give you status in the eyes of other fallen people, I'll give you security. Uh, but make no mistake, money also says, um, take up, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. To those who follow it, deny yourself healthy relationships, deny yourself a balanced life, deny yourself time with your kids, deny yourself the joy of being generous to others. That's what money says. Billy Graham said about this guy, the young man came with the right question to the right man. He got the right answer, but he made the wrong decision. And the question is, how, you know, how does this apply to us? Um, sh should we sell everything we have and give to the poor? Is that what Jesus is saying? Um, I think the answer is no. The Bible allows for people not just to have money, but to be rich. This, this was a particular command to a particular man. Money was the idol in the way of him following Jesus. So Jesus says, get rid of it. Then come follow me. So no, I don't think Jesus demands this of all his followers. But I do, <laughs> I do want to say, if that gives us an overwhelming sense of relief, oh, phew, thank goodness, I could never do that, then the chances are that Jesus would challenge us in the same way, wouldn't he? Perhaps money is the thing that's stopping you following Jesus. You, you know, you're happy to be around church, come to Christian things, float around the edge, but if you know if it came to it, it would be too hard to give up control of your money. Perhaps you are following Jesus, but this money is the idol that keeps popping up and disrupting your relationship with Jesus. It's the number one rival to Jesus in your heart. And don't forget, you don't have to have money in order for money to be an idol. And also, I think there's a difference between giving up and giving away everything. And to expose his heart, Jesus tells this guy to give away everything. Let's see if you can do that. That may not be what he says to us, but he does say to all of us, give up everything. Perhaps it's the difference between holding something uh, in an open hand and holding something in a closed fist. This guy was holding his money in, in a closed fist and that's what stopped him following Jesus. Holding it in an open hand for Jesus to use, for Jesus to, have, to be Lord over, um, is, is what Jesus wants from all of us. 
Of course, you may be holding other things in a closed fist. It doesn't have to be money. It could be a relationship, you know, that Jesus can't touch, which of course means that that relationship or that person is your God. It could be your independence or your control over your life. That's everything to you. So Jesus is fine until he challenges that. Well, then that independence and control is your God. It could be the approval of other people. You know, that means everything to you. So when there's a choice between Jesus and what other people think of you, you choose what other people think of you. Um, that's what you depend on for significance and worth and, and status. Jesus is saying to you today, remove the rival to me in your life. Get rid of the obstacle that's stopping you following me. It's necessary to give up everything to enter the kingdom of God. But then Jesus does a slightly odd thing and acknowledges that, secondly, it's harder for the rich to give up everything to enter the kingdom of God. Verse 22. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Does it feel like Jesus is targeting rich people, does it? Is he? Well, I think yes and no. Uh, we've already seen that actually, you know, it could be anything in your closed fist. There are lots of idols we could be worshipping instead of Jesus. It doesn't have to be money. But Jesus is saying such is the pull and the lure of, of money and possessions and stuff materialism that that it's harder particularly hard for a rich person to have the willpower to open up their fist and give it up actually he says more than that doesn't he it's not it's not just particularly hard is it it's impossible it's easier for a camel the largest mammal in that area to enter through the smallest of openings um i look i haven't done much sewing in my life but the the times that I have been needed to thread a cotton through a needle is it's almost impossible. I don't know how it's done. So I can't even thread cotton through a needle. Imagine threading a camel through a needle. Um, and you can't. Can you, it's, 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 you can imagine a slight glint in Jesus' eyes. He says it's, it's a joke. You know, It's so ridiculous. It's funny. I'm not sure the disciples are laughing, though. The disciples uh, were already amazed at his words in verse 24. Now in verse 26... The disciples were even more amazed, we're told. So they'd always been taught that material wealth was a sign of blessing from God. Now they're being told it's not just harder for the rich to enter the kingdom of God, it's impossible. You can imagine them just like throwing up their hands and saying, I don't know, who then can be saved? And Jesus, you know, Jesus, you say it's essential for this guy to give up his money to follow you. It's essential, but it's impossible. Essential, but impossible. That, that is a scary combination, isn't it? And it's worth asking, why is it that Jesus seems to target the rich here? Why, why is it particularly impossible, if that's the thing, particularly impossible for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Well, remember, Jesus says you need to, remember what Jesus says you need to be in order to enter the kingdom of God. You need to be like a child. And Jesus is saying, left to ourselves, it's impossible to be that child. It's particularly impossible, though, if you're rich, because money gives you a false sense of security, right? I don't need help. You, you get used to fixing your own problems. Don't need to trust God when you can trust your bank balance. Being that child means acknowledging desperately you need help. Money also gives you a false sense of status. It can cause you to think that you're important. Entering the kingdom of God means admitting that you're not somebody important. You're a child. Money gives you a false sense of success. Our culture measures success in numbers and lifestyle, doesn't it? But to enter the kingdom of God, you need to acknowledge that you're not successful in everything. You're not successful in the most important area, and that is your relationship with the God who made you. You ignore him, you replace him, you dilute him into something manageable. In order to enter the kingdom of God, you need to admit failure. It can be harder for the rich to do that. So watch out for money. If you're longing to be rich, right? if you spend your time dreaming about how you would spend millions, 
You, you just need to know that money can do dangerous things to you, eternally dangerous things. But not just the rich, with all of us, because of the sin, the idolatry in our hearts, this salvation is impossible. Who then can be saved? One writer describes that question, who then can be saved, as a doorway to hope. Until you've felt that desperation, the helplessness that the disciples are feeling here, you can't enter the kingdom of God because you still suspect you can do it yourself in some way. Jesus looked at them, verse 27. He looked at his desperate disciples and said, with man this is impossible, but, one of the great buts in the Bible, not with God. All things are possible with God. It's funny how often that verse is, is often used to make the opposite point. It's making, I can be successful and rich. I can make it. I can be something. All things are possible with God. But getting rich is the easy bit. It's giving it up, says Jesus. That's impossible. It's worshipping Jesus instead of money. That's impossible. It's choosing Jesus over our idols. That's impossible. But not with God. All things, salvation for all people caught in idolatry is possible with God because he is a God who breaks into our hearts by his spirit. He shows us in his word that he is a better, um, more loving, more holy, more glorious, more majestic God than any of the idols we're tempted to worship, even the more powerful God, even more powerful than the God of money. And he shows us that he is that loving God by dying for us. Every other idol will require you to die for it. Jesus looks at us, loves us, and dies for us so that we can be forgiven for the way we've preferred false gods over the true God. And so we can live a life of true worship in the kingdom of God by the power of his spirit. And that is the good life. That is the way to do life. He is the spiritual adult we need. All things are possible with God. Perhaps you've experienced that. But sometimes you wonder whether it's worth it. Is, it. is it worth the sacrifice? Seems to be something these disciples are wondering here. The third thing to see, it's worth giving up everything to enter the kingdom of God. P Peter seems to be, have been a, a little bit shaken by what he's just seen. Verse 28, Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Right? We've somehow done the impossible. We've done what this guy couldn't do. Have we made the right call? He wants reassurance, and it comes in the next verse, doesn't it? Verse 29, Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life but many who are first will be last and the last first. So in this present age, he's saying, if you've left brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children for me in the gospel, as many of those disciples had physically left behind in order to follow Jesus towards Jerusalem, um, although I should say <laughs> he's not advocating abandoning your family, the Bible encourages uh, us to honor and to look after and love our families, but, but he's saying if your relationship with them has been compromised or strained because you're a Christian, if, as they still do in the Middle East, they throw you out of the family uh, because you're a Christian, hold a funeral for you in some cases, or if you've just pushed to the edges of your family, if that's happened to you, you need to know that you will not fail to receive a hundred times as much in your Christian family. Even if you've left resources like homes or fields, you will receive as much in your Christian family uh, in their resources. He's not saying suddenly you become a, you know, a rich property owner in the same way that you don't, by some freak of biology, suddenly have a hundred mothers. He's talking about the blessing of church family. Um, and I was thinking about it this week. You know, I've been involved in a couple of um, global church planting networks. So I, I know that if, if, if um, I, I happen to be in almost, almost any city in the world, particularly in Africa, I could, I could call up the pastor and we would consider each other brothers and no doubt he would welcome me into his home. In fact, the same would probably be true of, of other people at Trinity Morningside. Isn't that amazing? 
but not just out there, in here as well. Because we have the same Father, we are brothers and sisters, so we look after each other like brothers and sisters. We love each other, we care for each other, we welcome each other into our homes, we share meals with each other. His point is, whatever you leave for me in the gospel, you will receive a hundred times as much in your church family here and now. Of course, underneath all this is the challenge, of course, to be that church family, to be the family that looks after each other. So in this present age, a huge family. And in the age to come, says Jesus, well, we're back to where we started, aren't we? Back to what the rich guy so desperately wanted but was unable to get, eternal life. The perfect world we all desire and we're made for a perfect physical new creation with no more illness, death, pain, violence, whatever, of any kind. Again, his point is, whatever you leave for me in the gospel may seem like a huge sacrifice, and it may hurt you now, but it's insignificant, actually, when you think about eternity in God's new creation. You gain so much more. Um, It's like perhaps like an investor complaining about giving up his 100 rand. Because, you know, you'll say, well, that that 100 rand will be 1,000 rand next year. Or the farmer complaining about losing his seed in the ground. Yeah, but what about the harvest? We gain so much more from Jesus than we ever sacrifice for Jesus. I wonder if you believe that. Or are you still dependent on false gods to give you what only Jesus, the true God, can give you? Or or, or are you tempted to return to false gods because you're beginning to doubt that following Jesus is worth it? I started off talking about a child abandoned Um, on the streets. I don't know if you've read the story of Oliver Twist. Um, It's Charles Dickens' book. Uh, A couple of movies have been made. Um, It's a story about a a young boy who's abandoned on the streets of 19th century London, terrible conditions, and he gets taken in by this horrible old man called Fagin, who runs this kind of child pickpocketing ring. I mean, in modern day, this is is very serious stuff. Um, And he runs runs this child uh, pickpocketing ring He's very unkind to Oliver. Oliver's got a a roof over his head, but Fagin's very unkind, forced to steal, lives in awful conditions. Um, Eventually, though, as he's working on the street, he gets recognized by a certain Mr. Brownlow, who's a a gentleman of means, and he he recognizes this boy as some distant relative. And um, he takes him in, gives him a home, gives him a, a family, gives him a future, and he goes from being a dependent boy on a horrible destructive man to being a dependent on a loving caring rich man and I think that illustrates so many of our stories we were essentially a slave enslaved to the idol of money or whatever it is we were a dependent mistreated by that idol but unable to get out Jesus sees us in our sin and loves us And by his spirit, he makes possible what was impossible for us. And he offers us eternal life in a perfect world. It would be odd to turn that down and stay with Fagin, wouldn't it? And yet that's what this rich guy in this passage has done. He's preferred the idol of his money over life, eternal life with the true God. It would also be odd for Oliver Twist, having been adopted into Mr. Brownlow's family, to go back onto the streets and back into Fagin's care. And yet that's what we do when we we get distracted by other gods, begin to serve those other gods rather than Jesus. Those are not good gods to live under. They do not love us. What must I do to enter the kingdom of God? Not Not what must I do, what must I be? I must be a child. I must be at the end of myself, at the end of my spiritual resources, in need of a spiritual adult. Then I must get rid of whatever else I'm worshipping. Instead, it's necessary to give up everything to enter the kingdom of God. It'll be harder for the rich to do that, but possible with God. And so worth it. In this age, a church family, and in the age to come, eternal life, we gain far more from Jesus than we ever give up for him. Praise God for that. Let's, Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much that these things are true. We thank you that your son spoke hard words to us, but um, they are true. We, we, it is necessary for us to put Jesus, the eternal king, before any other 
insignificant God that we're worshipping. It's harder, we know it's harder for the rich to do that. And I pray for those of us um, who are entrapped by this idol of money <clears throat> to be able to put that to one side and to see the glory of the true God. And we thank you for these words of reassurance that for those of us who are trusting Jesus, it's so worth it to follow Jesus into the kingdom of God. And we thank you for this church family, global church family that we enjoy. And we thank you for the promise of eternal life in a wonderful, new, physical, perfect creation. And to that we look forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Great to be with you. Um, if you have any questions or comments, do um, sling them through over WhatsApp and we'll be in touch. Thanks so much.